This is one of them drill bits I had picked up to the flea market and I showed it in s and S. I I uh, did the electrolysis on it to clean it up. There's a one and five eighths with a number five Morse tape. Morse taper, I mean. I'm gonna put it to use down there on the big lathe. I'm just drilling a hole. I already touched it up once right here, but I figured I'd go ahead and, and uh, get a little video of putting the grind on it. We're on the 12 inch bow door grinder here. Hopefully it's not shaking too bad there. That's not the, the angle that you typically use, but this is what was ground on the drill and I was just copying that angle, whatever it is. Well, let's go see if it'll cut. This is a Morse taper socket extension. This one was given to me by Tom Lipton quite a while back. It might have been a couple years now. He'd give me this and another one that I use over there on the bore mill a lot. It's a number five Morse taper to a number five Morse taper, so it's basically an extension. But it's, it's handy on lathes, like over here, where if you got different drills that you're gonna be using, instead of knocking the sleeves off if you don't have enough sleeves, because this is a number six here, you can just use this and just knock your, you know, you use your drill chuck and you, you knock it out and then you stick your drills in there. All right, I'm gonna give that a, give it a little, tap make sure it's seated there I already started drilling it but I didn't like the way the drill was cutting it had a messed up edge so that's why I was touching it up let's see if let's see if I got my grind right A little twist you just seen that was where the tang wasn't met up with the set screw inside the the quill right here so it it turns until the the set screw comes up against the tang properly and that also happens in the down here on the slots There's my three inch stubby drill. We're gonna see how it'll do, open this hole up. I went over there and touched it up. You see a fresh grind there on each flute. It was a little bit of, it was burned up a little bit right there on the corners. And it seemed like the drill was, it was taking too much force. I can usually tell just by how, how easy the drill is to go in, in a hole, whether it's drilling correctly or not. Sometimes you just live with it and you get the hole drilled and sometimes you, you're like, nah, let's go touch the drill up. But, it doesn't matter what size the drill is if it's if it's drilled correctly or I mean if it's ground correctly and you got a good little pilot hole where it's not trying to use a chisel point drills should usually go in there pretty smooth it shouldn't take a whole lot of force so I'm gonna try it again and see if my grind helped all right I can tell that that ground that grind did help it it's a little easier to go in there now
see the longer chips coming off there. Gone in there with this two inch bar and flattened out the back. So I've got it six inches deep. It gives me one inch clearance for the threads. The threads themselves are five inches long. So we got about uh, 400 thousandths to come out of this. I believe I've showed this before, but let's show it again. Getting set up to do my internal threads, this is going to be a three and a half inch 12 thread. But what I'm pointing out here is setting your your stop where you want to disengage. Now I don't have an undercut in there. I don't typically worry about that if I if I, if I know I have plenty of room in there. I just run it out and I disengage, you know, the the uh, cross slide. But what but what you can do to set your depth if you don't have a digital readout. I don't have a digital readout on this machine, so I use measurements and uh, dial indicators. Okay, the threaded part going in there is five inches long so you want you want a little bit more thread than that let's just round that off to five and a half inches in there so that you know the threads don't bottom out in the back so I stick the bar out six inches using my six inch scale right here and I've got a little bit more clearance on the depth by the way I went about six and an eighth all right so we got six inches stick out right here everything's tight Let's go ahead and run it in there. Now, if I know that, that that bar is sticking in there six inches and I want five and a half inches, you can just come up to your part like this using your scale and just by, by eyesight, eyeball measurement, bring your the edge of your holder up a half inch. So if you subtract a half inch from six, what does that give you? It's five and a half inches. That's how far in there that we're gonna cut that. It's five and a half inches. So before you move it, come over here. I like to use a dial indicator whenever I'm coming up to a stop point. And I actually had already set that, but I'll go ahead and move that around here to zero. And whenever I'm coming in here and threading, I'm gonna be watching this dial right here. And when it comes on around to that first zero, that's when I'll disengage. And that half inch gap leaves me plenty of room in case I miss my throw, you know, and this goes past and this carriage moves forward just a little bit. One thing that I forgot to mention before you set your depth is to go ahead and get your tool set to where you want to, your touch off. Because if, you, if you're like me and you set your compound on an, on an in-feed angle there, once you come back and you're trying to touch your tool off, it's gonna re that's gonna change the position of your boring bar. So I'm gonna reset the depth there. I just got ahead of myself. Uh, I've got my cross slide set to our uh, our hard stop, and I'm using the the uh, compound. I'm gonna touch the tool off instead of zero here. get some cut on that tool it'll it won't chatter so bad okay our pitch is set correct just checking that tool making sure that it's not chipped on the corner but it's good there's nothing wrong with it these snap tap inserts man they've always worked really good they last a long time
putting a little bit of penetrant in there. I'm going to go ahead and screw the eye in and see if it fits. We should be there. I'm going to have to make another pass. I didn't quite go to the full depth, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't cut it too big. That, that's why it's nice to have a, an undercut where you first start something like this. It's easier to get that thing lined up and threaded in there. That next pass through there, cut it where it needed to be. I've not screwed it all the way in there. It just takes a while. It's five inches long. But you can see right there. It's got a good fit. I would have preferred it to be actually a little bit more loose than that. You see I'm pulling on it. You can really... You're not seeing a thing move. And some of these fits like this can be really fussy if you got it too close. Any little burr can screw it up. So we got her done. Go ahead and unscrew this thing and get it out of there. We need to cut a lead angle on this right here for our seals and wipers to go over. That's that hard, that's that hard surface there, that induction hardened. So we're going to use that TH1000 insert made by Seco. It's going to be pretty much all in the hard section. Let's see if it'll cut it. We've got steady rest and the center on here. I hope I don't destroy it. Looks like it handled it just fine. That insert always amazes me. That's a good one right there. So I'll, I'm just gonna go ahead and hit it with a regular chamfering tool there to break this edge. And then I'm gonna dress it over with the air grinder, really soften that up, blend it together really well. Uh, it's a nice little trick to really soften these edges up and then we're gonna we're gonna use the belt sander this is where your steady rest is running now it's not scratched it's just it's taking the polish off the surface there's another spot right there where i had to move it back when i was doing my threading so we're going to hit this area with the belt sander and you'll see that it'll take all that out Nice, fresh, clean surface there. I got the rod flipped around. Now I got to do a little bit of facing, about three eighths. I'm gonna try that insert again and see if we can bust through.
All right, you see how that chain sound there? That real squeaky part is your hardened section, and now we're in the soft core. I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna face it all the way to the center. I'm gonna get it faced to the length, and then I'll switch out tools and uh, get the rest of it face down. So from there, I'll come back and I'll make another cut. Taking a sixteenth of cut, by the way. And now we can move some metal, taking one eighth to pass. We got it sped up too, we're running three eighty five now. So this is the opposite end of the rod, this is the piston end. We gotta be turned down for the piston and the nut. And I'm gonna use this to insert, I'm gonna try to get through it all at one cut. I've got it dialed in 400 thousandths or 200 per side, and that should get underneath the hard crust there. So let's give it a shot. That's some bad stuff right there. I was trying to see what it did. It looks like it pulled the tool in some. Got this end turned down, now I'm doing the threading. This is a three inch 12 thread for the nut. I've already checked it. It's good to go. This is the nut that actually goes on the rod here. That's a good fit right there. You use the red Loctite on that and then drill and tap it and put a set screw in the end to ensure that this thing never backs off. All right, the only thing we got left to do is just polish this in, deburr the, the sharp edges, and this one's done. All 
All right, we got that one done. I got one more job here that we'll show you for this S&S, and I'll talk you through it here. I got some pictures and a couple clips on my iPhone. So what this is, this is a, a blind in, or also it can be called a butt plate for a hydraulic cylinder. And the two ears that were welded on there were pretty well worn out. I got them sitting there just to the left. I'll show you in a second here. So I bandsaw cut those off, and we just ordered the new ears and and uh, weld them on there. And then once they're welded on, I drill them and line bore them back to size for the pin. So after getting it milled flat, I had to weld some new ears on there. And this is a few pictures that I took just showing the uh, welding process that I went through. I used some 7018 Lincoln Excalibur welding rods there. And I started with a 1.8 rod running about 130 amps to make a root pass all the way around. And then I cover that with a 532nd rod running about 165 amp. And it laid in there really nice. It, the welds turned out really good. I was very pleased with it. Lucky for me, I was able to put this in a nice position there in the vise to make it more of a flat position, which is the easiest to weld there. But it all worked out real good. The welds flowed in there nice and hot, and there it is finished up. And I was really pleased with the outcome of it. It, it, it looked really good, which makes me happy. Here's a couple more shots showing the, the fillet. I had about uh, 5 sixteenths to uh, 3 eighths of fillet in there. And then after I welded and it cooled down, I went to the boring mill, and here, here I am drilling it with a 1 and 5 eighths drill bit and get it drilled, and then I bore it to 1 and 3 quarter for a pin. And this is just a clip of uh, chamfering each side of the hole using the boring bar. I've got a half inch tool bit there that I ground uh, that I use for chamfering. And then once it's there, it is all finished up. It's ready to go, ready to ready to assemble back onto the cylinder. So this is one more clip that I had taken for Instagram, and it's showing my Noga Mini Cool there, and that's a two-inch boring bar that has through coolant. It's a CNMG 432 insert, and what I was doing was showing how how good that unit works for the, a coolant on that boring bar. I just stick the nozzle in the end of it and, and turn it on high with a lot of coolant and you see it does a good job of flooding that carbide and keeping the workpiece nice and cool.